The date is December 18th, 1997. For the first time, a Japanese cartoon called Pokemon has made its way into the English language news. It's a less than positive story. It was widely reported on then and it's a well-known story now. This article from the Asheville Citizen Times reports on the nearly 600 children who were hospitalized while watching the TV Tokyo anime, Pokemon. They are of course referring to the infamous Electric Soldier Paragon episode that never aired in the United States because of the issues viewers had with seizures. Which, yeah, fair enough. The article states, an affected child would momentarily stare and not respond even to shouting, or have a stiffening of the body with jerking arms and legs for up to a minute. That wasn't an all around great start to life in the media spotlight, but things would get better for Pokemon. Today I'm taking an entirely random look through Pokemon's history in the news because I honestly have nothing better to do. In 2020, print media is slowly fading into obscurity while digital media continues to take over, but 140 years ago, newspapers were key, websites didn't exist, and the first article semi-associated with Pokemon was published in the Hutchinson Herald. Okay, it has nothing to do with Pokemon. It was just about some guy called Professor Oak, and it's really not interesting in the slightest, but I couldn't pass over this mini-story that was featured nearby. It reads, A large crowd of tramps have been infesting the city for the last week or two, and our hotel keepers have been bored greatly by them. This is something unusual, as tramps rarely bother this town. 1880 was weird. That's about it for Pokemon until the media giant was actually created, but there was this thoroughly dull piece about cold in the Chicago Tribune on August 21st, 1898. It also isn't about Pokemon, but it does say Ash, Ketchum right there. Okay. Let's jump forward a little over a century and across the world to Australia. The Pokemon craze has already taken over the globe at this point, and a man by the name of John Saxby is asked to cover a Pokemon event at the Chadstone Shopping Centre for Melbourne's The Age. I have a feeling that Mr. Saxby wasn't terribly happy about this assignment. He goes all out to insult the attendees and just be incredibly weird, but the highlight is a verbal attack directed towards 16-year-old self-proclaimed Pokemon genius, Craig. Saxby writes, Craig spends at least five hours playing Pokemon every day. Spit pools in the corner of his mouth when he speaks and he appears to have lost the ability to blink but otherwise appears none the worse for it. It's not only kids that are targets for Saxby though. An attending parent that he quotes doesn't exactly get off unscathed. He describes her as an overweight woman in a cream and pink tracksuit cradling a carton of Long Beach 50s and a small child. The whole article is a little bizarre, like Saxby's description of Poketor host Angie as an olive-skinned beauty with a single plait that swings from the back of her baseball cap. But unquestionably, the most troubling paragraph begins, Impossibly good-looking children parade bright summer fashions to an audience of tiny tots staking out positions for Pikachu's 1pm show. Nobody should ever be describing children as impossibly good-looking. I feel like I shouldn't need to say that. Like, just don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. I read through this whole thing assuming it was a satirical piece because that's how it reads, but The Age appears to be a regular Australian newspaper. I just think John Saxby did not like Pokemon. Moving towards the end of the millennium, we've reached the North American release of Pokemon, the first movie, Mewtwo Strikes Back. Along with a new film, you typically get plenty of reviews, and this one's no different. There were two categories of review for the original Pokemon movie, film critics taking it way too seriously, and adults who ask young fans for their opinions. One of those categories features unbelievably dull reviews like Margaret A. McGurk's article for the Cincinnati Enquirer, but I'm going to focus on the other side of things. What I learned while researching for this video is that kids reviewing Pokemon movies is the best thing ever. Indiana's Kokomo Tribune did a movie ticket giveaway contest and let the winners give their opinions. This was a very good decision. Travis, age 9, said, It was cool. I thought Mew was funny because he was bouncing on the bubble and stuff. It's just like the cartoon. My, my favourite part was when the Glasteroids were fighting clones. I don't know what Glasteroids are, but I'm glad Travis put it in there. Charizard is my favourite character. He fights the clone Charizard. He does. That happens. I remember that. Jacob's review focused more on the key plot points. Mewtwo made clones out of Blastoise, Charizard, and Bensaur. <laughs> the people who thought Mew evolved into Mewtwo were wrong. But scientists took, <laughs> took DNA and transformed into Mewtwo. Do you guys remember that scene in the first movie when the scientist, like, he injects himself with DNA and he becomes Mewtwo? Pretty wild. Probably my favourite scene too, actually. 
Although they're all pretty great, we're gonna finish on Blake's incredible review and I'm going to read it in full. I thought the movie was totally, totally, super de duper, matchamp awesome. I have never seen Mewtwo so strong and so angry. It was neat seeing Mew so happy. The battle was awesome. There was colliding, slamming, bamming. It was as neat <laughs> it was as neat as Marowak's Bone Club attack. The movie had awesome graphics and Team Rocket this time was not trying to capture Pikachu. They were hilarious in this movie, not like the rest of the movies. <laughs> this is a review for Pokemon, the first movie. I thought of all of the Pokemons, the best one was Gyarados using its awesome Hyper Beam attack. I never seen a Pidgeotto fly so quick. All in all, I loved this movie and would like to see it again. Let me be the first to say Blake should be in charge of all movie reviews for the rest of time. The movie wasn't so universally popular with its young reviewers though. The Brattleboro Reformer also let fans weigh in and 11 year old Kirby didn't like everything that the movie had to say. That's a child named Kirby, not the Nintendo character who was of course only 7 at the time. Human Kirby had this to say. The end of the movie was very dumb and almost idiotic. That turned into a Barbie doll kind of movie. After the fight with Mewtwo, it's Barbie doll. I honestly have no idea what that means, but yeah, I, I respect it. Lastly, we're going to check out the Pokemon Fan Speak section of the November 15th, 1999 edition of the Tampa Bay Times. There were plenty of insightful reviews here, but let's start with Clay, who spoke in depth about one of the film's stars. Mew's my favorite character because he rocks, he makes cool sounds, and he looks like a kitty cat. Good point, Clay. I'm with you there. Tampa's resident psycho child Ryan knows what he likes. It was awesome when Mewtwo blew up the factory in the scientist's laboratory. Look, Ryan knows what he likes and we have to respect that and probably also keep our distance from him. Finally, let's have a look at Keith's review. It was totally awesome when Mew and Mewtwo were battling. Mew is definitely my favorite Pokemon. I like the movie, but I didn't see enough of the new, <laughs> of the new character, Rubu. Who is Rubu? There's only one more review that I want to talk about and it's from Christmas Eve 1999. Honestly, it doesn't have much to do with the actual focus on the Pokemon movie and is more a question of how this reviewer gave The Phantom Menace and The Green Mile the same star rating. Those two movies should not have the same rating. Not even close. That's about it for reviews, although I do just want to quickly show you this article about Pokemon the Movie 2000. It's actually quite a good review from the North County Times, but I just want to read you the headline. Pokemon. Visually yummy. Entertaining. Speaking of Pokemon, let's have a quick look at this piece from the Post Crescent Sun where Mary Beth Matzek spells Pokemon correctly, and then one paragraph later spells it as Pokoman, and then as Pokeman in the very next sentence. This is the sort of inconsistency that I love. Keep it up, Mary Beth. Misspellings and Pokemon articles go together like Mewtwo Strikes Back and Rubu. This mini letter to the editor from the Herald in March of 2000 notes all the kinds of Pokemon that second grader Derek has drawn. It's mostly just the classics like Bulbasaur, Richu, Charmalum, <laughs> Mutt, and Squirrel. There are countless examples of journalists talking about Pokemans, but how about some good articles about how to incorporate the Pokemon craze into teaching? This piece from the Record Sun combines the two nicely. An interesting article about using Pokemon to relate better to students where the writer spells Pokemon wrong 12 times. A slightly better example comes from our good friend Buddy Morehouse. He suggests in English you could ask students to circle the subject, verb, and object in the sentence, Pikachu caught three Pokemon. Where did the electric type get three Pokeballs? We may never know, but he actually made some good points, so good work, buddy. Another series of stories that were prevalent around this time were about Pokemon cards and merchandise being banned in schools. It happened in my school and I'm sure if you're old enough it probably happened in yours too. Sadly, an equally common item at the time was about cards being stolen and kids getting violent because of their Pokemon obsession. On November 13th, 1999, this story broke about a student who charged his teacher, pushed him and choked him because the teacher had confiscated his Pokemon cards. I'm going to give you all 10 seconds to guess which state this happened in. Okay, 10, 9, 8, 7, Florida. It was Florida. Of course it was Florida. For the most part, the articles I read about students attacking each other because of Pokemon were not particularly entertaining though, so let's move on to Christmas. Let me introduce you to Michael McManus. 
you know an article is going to be fantastic when the second sentence starts with Pokemon, the card game TCG. McManus writes that the ideal Christmas gift is one that will draw a person closer to Jesus. Then he goes on to quote David Brown's The Problem with Pokemon that describes Pokemon's characters as headstrong, stubborn, quibbling, self-centered, vindictive, obnoxious, hormonal, sexually preoccupied, evil, thieving, cross-dressing jerks who are definitely not biblical role models. Moving past that deeply troubling and hilariously ridiculous line of thinking, let's check in with Bob Walazowski, who recommends the Harry Potter books instead of Pokemon. Although thanks to the occultism and secularism present in Harry Potter, he further endorses C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia, which paints a picture of Christ and the Gospel. Michael McManus is no Bob Walazowski, though. He says that if his children were young, he would buy either of two books by William J. Bennett, The Book of Virtues or The Moral Compass. It really seems to me like nobody is less suited to writing a column about Christmas gift giving than McManus. Maybe we should have a look back at what children really wanted for Christmas in 1999. On December 24th of that year, Decatur, Illinois' Herald and Review published letters to Santa from local children and almost half of them were after something Pokemon related. Some kids like Kedra had simple wishes. Dear Santa, I would like to have a doll and a real Pokemon for Christmas. I also want a new art thing, a Backstreet Boys Movine, and an NSYNC movie. I want a new crown too. It sort of seems like Santa actually granted Kedra's wish, although neither existed at the time, as of 2015 the world has been given an NSYNC movie and a Backstreet Boys movie. I can only assume Kedra got the real Pokemon too. Some kids weren't after Pokemon and just wanted to know how Santa Claus was doing, others really wanted some Pokemon merch. Ethan W wasn't too greedy though, he just wanted a colored Game Boy, Pokemon Blue, Pokemon Yellow, Pokemon Gold and Silver, Pokemon Green, Pokemon Purple, Pokemon Snap, Pokemon Pinball, all Pokemon movies, all Pokemon cards that I don't have, Pokemon Bouncy Balls, Pokemon Balls with Pokemon in it. I don't even want to talk to you if Pokemon Purple isn't your favorite game. Ethan wasn't alone in his craving for multiple games though. Dear Santa, I would like all the Pokemon games, and a car, and a Digiman movie, and a van with a TV in it. <laughs> Your friend, Alex K. Santa really was all about greenlighting films in Christmas of 99, because Digiman the movie was released in October of 2000. I'm gonna finish this video off with my two favourite letters of all. Firstly, Nick comes to Santa with a simple request. I want Pokemons for Christmas. The use of the word Pokemons makes me instantly happy. Finally, we've got Jesse R's poetic message to Saint Nick. Dear Santa, I wish for a Pokemon. I wish for a yo-yo, I love you, Nintendo 64. Okay, this has been a terribly incomplete history of Pokemon and print media. I'm sorry that you had to watch that, and you're welcome.